Morning everyone, welcome to worship. It's good to have you all join us. Um, I, it seems that doing notices is a thing again now. So um, the, as far as I know, the notices for this morning are things like, uh, please remember um, to return the questionnaire that Mary has put through the doors or, uh, or emailed out to you this week uh, about the, the, uh, the next steps for opening up chapel. Um, and secondly, remember this afternoon, uh, we are meeting, or those who can are meeting at chapel uh, at four o'clock for a time of prayer. Um, socially distant, of course, around the outside of the building, but a chance to pray and uh, and seek God's will in the next steps for us as a church as we seek to come out of uh, lockdown and see what happens next. Um, it's lovely to have David with us again this morning, and I think he'll be leading us in uh, an act of communion um, as we share together in this morning's worship. Let's begin by uh, having a, a psalm together and then a time of prayer. So this is Psalm 36, verses 7 to 9. How precious is your unfailing love, O God! All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. You feed them from the abundance of your own house, letting them drink from your river of delights. For you are the fountain of life, the light by which we see. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you join us in this time of worship. Thank you that we can meet in your presence and know that we are meeting together, one family, joined by your love. We ask that you be a part of all that we do this morning. Fill this time of worship with your spirit. Renew us, refresh us and send us out to do your will. Be with us now. Amen. Today's reading is from Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 to 19. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway <clears throat> resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I am not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is not... None other than the house of the God, none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called this place Bethel, though the city used to, though the city used to be called Luz. I've hidden some of God's promises in the garden. So, do you want to go and find them? Mummy, yes! Challenge accepted!
got to. He said, it says promise. Now I'm going to open this one. I'm going to start opening the pink leg. Flower. I see a flower card. Me too. Now, let's see what God's promises is. What does it say? What promise? God's promise is my plan for you. Our good, not bad. They will give you a fruit and a don't be God's promise. Don't be afraid. I am with you. What does this one say now, God? What does it say? I will never leave you. Never leave you. Okay. God's promise. I will give every person a dog if you in me. I am black cat for life and just um, six dead girls. My love is faithful. I am merciful. So everybody, ah. let's draw a rainbow. I'm going to draw one first. Yeah, big rainbows. Oh, you're doing it like that. Excellent. Does anyone know why we draw rainbows when we're talking about promises? It's to sh show God's love is in the air. No, God is the important thing in your heart. Is that why? No, yeah. the rainbows are the symbol to love. Rainbows are the symbols for promises because God that, put a promise yeah. in the um, put a rainbow in the sky the first time. He made a promise to Noah, which was after the flood, and the Lord promised that he would never flood the earth again. And he put a rainbow in the sky as a symbol of his promise. A rainbow blessing! Go, go, go. No! Don't finish. He promised Noah never to flood the whole world again, and and we made um, pictures of rainbows. Nikki made a rainbow human, and Georgina made lots of glittery and different colors. I made a rainbow. In a short while, we're gonna put our promises that we found on the pictures. Not like that. Do you remember the reading that we yeah. were looking at earlier on? Yeah. What was it about? It was about a Jewish dream where somebody put a hard rock under their head. They had a dream that, uh, that a, a, a ladder came down from to the earth from heaven. The angels were climbing up and down it, and, I think so and at the top, God was, uh, and he talked to the person. Yeah, the man was called Jacob, and do you remember I what God said to him? Uh, 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 he said that he would bless all of Jacob's descendants, that they would become so numerous, they would be like the dust on the earth, and they would spread to the north and the south, the east and the west, That's and the that he would, and that the Lord would bring them back to the land where Jacob was sleeping on, 
And the Lord also said that he was always going to be with Jacob and he would never leave them until everything that he said happened. What was God doing there? What was he making there with he Jacob? He was making a promise. He was making a promise. It's like a pinky promise, but, but he can't reach out through somebody's hand because he's a spirit. So God made a promise with Jacob and he made a promise that he would always be with him and that he would never leave him and that he would keep his promise for all of his descendants for all time. And does God make promises with us? Yeah. Yeah. What sort of promises does he make? He makes promises about things like like what Jacob did. Yeah, so he, he makes, makes promises. I love! He makes promises that he'll always be with us, that he'll never leave us. He'll, he'll, um, he'll, not, he'll not go back on his promise. He'll never go back on his promise, exactly. He won't leave our side until his promise has happened. That's right, yeah. and so we can trust that God will always do that. Anything he promises us, he will never leave our side. That's right. Hello everyone, David here with some thoughts about the wonderful story of Jacob's Ladder. Now it's a really familiar story, of course, and it has its background, its genesis, in the promise that God gives to Abraham. That Abraham and his family will be a blessing to the whole earth. And that promise moves through the family. It's how it has its outworking. It cascades down the generations. And so Isaac uh, embodies that promise himself. And then his two sons, Esau and Jacob, his two twin sons, uh, not identical, of course, they're the next generation to take the promise on. And that's where it all goes wrong. And in this story, in this moment, it looks as though it's going to be impossible to move forward with God's promise because Jacob has deceived his father Isaac. Isaac is old, his sight's not good, and Jacob's elder twin Esau, by right, deserves Jacob's blessing and inheritance. And of course, as we know, at the instigation of his mum, Rebecca, Jacob tricks Isaac into giving him the blessing instead. And when this all comes to light, Esau, his brother, is absolutely furious and promises to get revenge, promises to kill Jacob. And so Jacob is sent off by his mum and his dad to go and find a wife in Haran. And that's where we join the story. So there's been epic deceit, there's been a complete failure on Jacob's part to uphold the morality that God wants. And as he makes this journey, we join him at the end of the first day. And you wonder what's going through his mind. So many things, you think, as he lays down to sleep. Uh, he's not got a tent. He's not even got a bedroll. He takes a stone from the side of where he is, just picks it up, puts it down and puts his head on it. And that's his pillow. And it's a really bleak moment. And as he goes to sleep, you can imagine all the sorts of fears and anxieties that are playing on his mind, uh, as they would play on ours. He's probably welcomed sleep and dreads the morning, dreads waking up to have to face who he is and what he's done and the implications of all of that. So the story we join it at this pivotal moment, not just for Jacob, but for God's promise and God's intention. And it seems to me that God intervenes. God speaks into the heart of Jacob's fear and his dread, into the heart of his dislocation and disconnection from his own family and from God's promise and from all that his grandfather Abraham stands for and was hoping to achieve the blessing of all nations. God speaks into that in a dream. Now, you could argue that this is just Jacob's psyche wrestling and putting things together 
Um, but I don't think that's right. I think in this moment of his lostness, God takes the initiative and God reaches out to Jacob in this dream because the dream speaks right into his fears. So Jacob fears himself to be disconnected, lost, and he has this vision of a ladder of light reaching up and down from heaven to where he is, and angels of God going up and down all the time, continually. I think that's a really beautiful image because it speaks right into God's response. What God wants Jacob to know is that he's still with him, would never leave him, and that God's purpose is still at work. The angels coming and going up and down from heaven to earth. God's purpose is vibrant and alive. And what's more, it's right there where he is sleeping. And so Jacob wakes up. And it's that moment of waking when we put things together in our own minds, when our imaginations are particularly open, I think, that we now find him putting two and two together and making sense of his dream and doing it powerfully. Because he exclaims that God is in this place and I didn't know it. And that begs all sorts of questions about, well, what place are we talking about? Because this is more than just a lesson in geography. Yes, he has discovered that in this place of dislocation, actually, God is there. God is everywhere. God is at work. God's purpose embraces and surrounds us. But it's more than that. In this place, I think, also points to his inner identity of who he is at the very core of his being. And Jacob is saying to himself, echoing God's dream, promise to him that God is there at the very core of his being too. God has not left him, even though Jacob has walked away. The place he's gone to in his shame and killed, God is reaching down right there too. So it's an epic story of hope and of identity. God reaffirms Jacob's identity, reaffirms the promise, working through from his grandfather and his father, cascading down the generations to him. He's not lost it. God doesn't give up on Jacob and he doesn't give up on us either. God is intentionally, in this moment of great peril, reaching deep into Jacob's soul to waken him, to aliven him, to energise him once more, to step forward on the pathway of hope and promise. That matters more than anything to Jacob, and it's the gift God gives him. So let's examine this as we look at the text. What Jacob needs to hear uh, is fascinating because as we see what God says to him we'll unpack that very need and the first thing is really important. God says I am the Lord. So let's just think about that. In the midst of all the turmoil and all the trouble that he's in, one thing he needs to know, that God has the situation in hand and that God is God. I am the Lord, says God to Jacob in the dream. And that's the most important statement of all, I think, is that we're, Jacob is putting all of himself into God's hands in this dream. At least God is encouraging him to see himself held by God who is the Lord, the God of creation, of everything that is, as the Bible says to us. God is the God in whom we live and move and have our being. And the most important thing is that Jacob holds on to that fact, that God is God. And that's true for all of us too. Naturally enough, of course, in this time of lockdown, we just need to trust that God is God. God is the Lord. Remember that fact and hold to that rock. And then God reminds Jacob of the promise. He says, 
the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. That's important too. The promise is in a line unbroken to him and he needs to hold fast to that, that God is being faithful to God's promise. Then God says, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Well, that's just outrageous, outlandish. What a wonderful way to reassure Jacob. Here God is actually helping him to see the very ground he's on. He's part of the promise and will be part of the gift that God will give to him. He can't see that, of course, can Jacob? He can't see much of anything, I guess, in his fear and his shame. Here he is in the dream. Not only is he reminded that God is God and that the promise is real through the generations to him, God is faithful and God is going to give the gift of land, not only to him, but to his offspring. The promise through the generations assured. And God emphasises this and says, Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south. This wonderful abundance of promise and hope spreads out to encompass the known world. And all of this through deceitful, hopeless Jacob, asleep in his fear. God reopens his imagination, his heart and his mind in this dream to everything that God is, the immensity, the magnitude, the power and the beauty of God's love. And that's what God wants you and me to hold on to, the immensity of all of that in Jesus, our Saviour, who died and is risen, uh, that we would inherit this promise, the wonder of grace itself, through us, to the whole world. And that's why here in this text what Jacob hears is the essential gospel. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. There it is. There is the task. There is the promise that this isn't just about Jacob, it's about mission in the most wonderful sense imaginable, that Jacob, broken, humiliated Jacob, is going to be the one in whom and through whom God's blessing will become real for those who need it. So in these first five verses, we have the essence of the gospel for this broken person. And we have the essence of the gospel in Jesus for you, for me, for everyone, forever. And then God makes some really important statements to Jacob. Know that I am with you. Just think about that. Know that I am with you. You may not think you deserve it, but I am always Wherever you go, I shall be there. That's what the, the ladder and the angels is saying to Jacob's deepest need. And God reaffirms his love of Jacob. No, I'm with you. More than that, I'll keep you wherever you go. We need to hear that verse. That verse is so important to us at the moment as we struggle to come out of lockdown and to move into a very uncertain future. We need to know that Jesus is with us and that he will keep us wherever we go. And not only that, Jacob understands in this dream, God saying to him, I will bring you back to this land. Coming back to where the promise began, coming back to his inheritance, coming back to God's gift that even though he's having to go away, God is already planning on bringing him back. And that's what God is doing with us and our church, planning to bring us back. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you, says God to Jacob. I won't leave you. I am with you. I will keep you. And all of that being true until I've done what I promised you. 
And for us, that promise is that God in Christ will take us into the family in heaven in glory. So let's just think about this a little more. This sense of disconnection and lostness and separateness that God is speaking into as Jacob dreams. The predicament is quite sparse for him. Now in this photograph, which I took at St Hilda's Priory, um, there is a profound sense of bafflement, at least for me, because if you can see a way to get into that door, you're a better one than I am. There is no way up. There is no way in. You've got this little room with a door, window the other side, but no way of getting in there. And to all those who feel like that in their relationship with God, to all those who feel cut off, to those who wouldn't even want to go up a ladder if there was one there, God is saying, look, I am with you. I'm not stuck separate. We are not apart. I'm always there. I'm always reaching out. I have a plan and a promise for you. Believe and have hope. This is one of my favourite sculptures ever, I think. It's a beautiful sculpture, uh, which was at uh, Wydale Hall, the Diocesan Retreat Centre. And on the right, you can see a tree which has been lopped down, um, brutalised, um, and they were wondering what to do with it. And so they got a, a really fantastic sculptor called uh, Colin. He came in and he made Jacob's Ladder out of, out of this tree that was otherwise going to be felled. And on the left-hand side of the image you can see what it looked like when it was new. What a transformation. At the bottom you can see the stone, the pillar, and then there carved into the tree is this wonderful ladder climbing up and there is an open door and a space at the top. What a wonderful evocation of this dream and this promise that wherever we are, we are in touch with God and the fulfilment of the gospel. But of course, the tree didn't last. Like anything organic, uh, it rotted away. And many years later, when I went to Wydale, this was all I could find of it. On the left-hand side, you can see what's left of that particular top part. You can see the little ladder, uh, the remains of the arch, the doorway has long gone. That's all there was. And a real sense of sadness looking at that. A real sense of loss. And maybe that's how many of us feel as we look at what we once had as church and how we worshipped and as we try and take all of that on board and look to the future it all seems so far away so difficult to return to but Jacob as he slept had his fears met by God's overwhelming love and grace and presence and in Jose de Ribera's painting, 17th century painting, you can see him asleep with all his anxiety. And there in light and majesty are the angels coming up and coming down. So no matter what we think has gone, no matter what we think won't be the same ever again, God is reaching out to us and holding us with promise and with purpose. And here is Turner's attempt to portray the same story with a lot of artistic and biblical license, I would say, because Jacob isn't on his own in the left part of the picture. He's with his family. Um, it makes for a better image, I guess. But the glory of Turner's image is fantastic. These angels coming and descending and rising and an angel, uh, the Lord there as well, um, conversing with Jacob, who's got a smile on his face, so far as I can see. A wonderful evocation of a moment of precious connection, showing that nothing is ever lost to us. The one in whom we live and move and have our being is the one in whom all things are held for eternity. 
So what is God saying to us as we dream? What is God saying into our anxieties as we look ahead? What is the promise that God wants us to make real as a church? Well, this image is part of the memorial to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the American president in Washington. It evokes for us uh, his New Deal. It is an evocation too of the Great Depression. On the left hand side is depicted rural poverty with uh, an elderly couple. On the right you've got five figures queuing in an urban street outside a door. Presumably they are queuing up either for food or for a handout. But there is a stark reminder of the context of suffering and struggle and loss and uncertainty in which the gospel always comes alive. A third of a nation, ill-housed, ill-clad, ill-nourished, was the context of the Great Depression. And I think Roosevelt's words speak into our own context as we look to the future and the recession that is fast becoming a reality and the huge unemployment that is going to be the lot of far too many people. The test of our progress, says Roosevelt, is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. And that's the test of our society, and that's the test of our faith, and that's at the very heart of the promise God gives to Jacob, because God's people are always intended to be a blessing for everyone, to share the bounty of God's creation with one another, with everyone. And so that is a big question, I think, for all of us as church. Not just how do we get back to our building, but how do we reach out and into the huge social and economic needs that are getting ever more acute as each day continues. So this story of Jacob has within it all the elements of the gospel. It has a God who reaches out in grace and love and passion and power to remind us that God is the God of creation, that Jesus is Lord. It reminds us that we're not lost and disconnected, but we're always part of God's promise and purpose, that God always loves us, and through us God reaches out to bless those who desperately need to be blessed, and that God won't let anything get in the way of that purpose and that promise. And because God knows what we're like, God says, I am with you and I'll walk with you and I'll stay with you and I will be with you through it all until the promise has come true. So in this time of challenge, as we are struggling to come out of lockdown, as we are really perplexed, about how to do church in new ways, about what it means to be so compromised in the use of our building, everything that is unfamiliar, I think there are real echoes here of Jacob's experience. We are making a journey we don't want to make. We're going away from what we know, from what gives us security and comfort, and we're journeying towards a destination which is very unclear. But what is true is that we're journeying within the promise, within the promise God makes real in Jesus, who is our Lord, who is here, who does reach out to us, who is present, and in the power of whose spirit we know that we belong and that there is hope, for there is nothing that love cannot face. So for us, the challenge is to make the promise real. It's to let God speak into those deep fears that we have in the same way that he spoke into Jacob's deepest and darkest fears as he dreamt. And the fact it's a dream, I think, encourages us 
because it's in that place of dream space possibility that God can break through and birth new possibility in a way that which, if we're fully awake and present to our fears, I think it's much more difficult for God to do that and for us to be aware of it. The really crucial thing is that Jacob marks this moment of revelation and hope and new life in God by putting up a pillar. He takes his, his pillow and makes it into a pillar and he consecrates it. He anoints it with oil. It's a marker. It's like a trig point in the landscape. It lets you know where you are. You can get your bearings from it. It's really important to say here at this time and this place, God met me. And what I'd like to suggest is perhaps it's going to be really helpful for us as we go forward to be mindful of those moments when God has reached out to us and reaffirmed us, held us, touched us with grace, brought us alive in Jesus, filled us with the Spirit, those key moments on our journey, let's be mindful of them as we look back because they will encourage us as we look forward. So why don't we just take some time to reflect, to think back about the people and the times and the places that are our significant markers of faith and let God speak reassuringly to us through those memories in the hope that what God is now doing is reaching out to us, speaking into our uncertainty and our fear and wanting us to find a new pathway, a new way forward, as yet unclear, but we know that wherever we are and whatever we are going through, God is there. That wonderful ladder of God's presence in Jesus is our truth. Jesus will never, ever desert us. Wherever we are, he is, and he consecrates that place with the glory of God. So even though we can't be together in the way that we want, God is with each of us and in God's presence we know that belonging and that togetherness. And it's that belonging and togetherness that's at the heart of our sharing of bread and of wine. We remember, we look back to that significant moment when Jesus broke bread and shared wine the night before he was executed. And it's a foretaste of the heavenly banquet, of his risen presence as we take bread and wine. He is with us. He reminds us, literally reminds our thinking and our dreaming with the beauty of God's love and God's hope. So we will join together and we will share in bread and wine and we will remember whose presence is with us and who will never ever desert us but will always want to bring us to that pathway of grace and hope which takes us into the very heart of the world's need. God bless. Good morning and as we come to this time of prayer um, I'm going to be praying using notes, so I'm going to have my eyes open for a lot of the time. Uh, but you might want to pray with your eyes closed or to concentrate on a picture or um, anything beyond your windows um, that would help you to still your heart and mind as we come before our Father in prayer. So let's start. And we pray, Lord, for the famine in Yemen. We know, Lord, that about 80% of the population are facing starvation. We know, Lord, that it's a desperate situation and we ask for your uh, mighty hand to come into that situation. We pray for food, for shelter, for water, for medical care, for anything that's needed to help keep people safe. We pray, Lord, that somehow they would know that you are with them in this crisis 
working towards a solution. And we pray, Lord, against the wars and the um, political processes that are going on which perpetuate these crises and indeed other crises as well. We ask you to forgive us, Lord, for our inhumane treatment of each other which allows such famines, such desperate situations to develop and continue. And with that in mind, Lord, we think of the refugee camps in Syria and beyond. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with everybody in those camps, that again, they would know your peace and your concern and your compassion for them. Lord, we don't know, we can't even begin to wonder the desperate situations which cause people to uproot from their f families and their homes and go to an unknown future. Lord, we know that Jesus was a refugee and we ask, Lord, that you would provide safe haven for everybody that needs it. For those that need resettlement from the camps, Lord, we pray that there would be countries, governments, communities welcoming and waiting to receive them. We pray that for our country, Lord, and for all countries that are in a position to accept desperate people from desperate circumstances that need a safe haven. We think of the COVID situation, which is making life even more desperate in the Yemen, in refugee camps where there's no social distancing and so little in the way of hygiene, sanitation and indeed adequate water and food. We pray for all the individuals and families directly and indirectly affected by COVID. And we do pray for a safe vaccine to be found and distributed to all as soon as possible. We pray for our political leaders in both government and the opposition to make decisions for the good of all people in the UK and beyond over the forthcoming months in terms of the easing of lockdown, managing COVID, managing the debts that have arisen as a result of COVID and even for the forthcoming and ongoing Brexit negotiations. So that decisions would be made for the good of all and not just for individual or party political, economic and political considerations. We think of the continuing and disturbing scenes of black men and women being singled out in the media in society for what appears to be unfair and unjust treatment. We pray against attitudes that identify groups of people for unfair and unjust treatment based on discriminatory attitudes. And we ask that you would convict and motivate us as your church to be committed to the need to eradicate evils of modern slavery, racism, sexism, xenophobia, and all that would divide us. And when that challenges us as a country, as a society, or individuals in our attitudes or privilege, give us the grace and love to wrestle with that, with an acceptance of the need to change. So that we are truly able to demonstrate by our actions and attitudes that the love of God through Jesus is truly available to everyone, regardless of our age, our race, our gender, our sexuality, our physical and mental health, or any physical or mental challenges we may face. We pray for all those that need a special touch of healing or comfort or protection from our loving Father at this time both within our congregation and outside. And we specifically think of Sally's forthcoming funeral. Please comfort and involve Chris and family with your love, comfort and protection. 
I'm going to pause here for a few seconds for you to raise up the people in your heart for your own individual private prayers to our Father. We pray for our church and we're using the strategic prayer guide which today concentrates on leadership. And we think of our minister, our stewards, our church council, the circuit, the circuit leadership and the leadership of the whole church of Jesus Christ. We thank you for our minister David that um, decided not to go on sabbatical in order that he could be with us during this time. And we ask that you give him a long, happy and just totally fulfilling retirement. We ask for the right decisions to be made uh, by stewards and the church council in terms of coming back together to worship, the unlocking of our church doors and for you reuniting in body as a congregation. We ask for wisdom and discernment to know what to do, when to do it and how to do it. And we thank you, Lord, for the fact that we've been able to take, stay together as a church through modern technology of Zoom and YouTube and everything else that's enabled us to just stay in contact. Thank you so much for that. But Lord, in these crucial months ahead, give our leadership wisdom to know what to do and how to do it. And I'm going to finish with this specific prayer, which uh, I thought was a good one in the light of what we've been talking about today and the current situation. God, we confess to you that sometimes our worries seem too big. We don't see a way out of our current situation and your timing seems different than that we would have chosen. But we know and believe that no matter how much we have struggled, you alone can see the big picture. And we praise you that you are with us in it all. Help us to hear your voice through the difficult days. Help us to set our eyes on you alone. Help us to keep moving in the direction you are leading us. Thank you for your reminders that through every weakness and hard place, your strength is displayed in beautiful ways through our lives. We can't do it on our own, Lord. We're so freshly aware of that. But you can work your great miracles in us and through us. Thank you that this battle will never have the final say over our lives. And because of your power and compassion, we will come through to the other side with greater perseverance, stronger faith and deeper awareness of your presence with us. Thank you that you are fighting for us and you will bring us out as gold. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so here we are, gathered together. So let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for Jesus, who is always with us, to remind us that our identity is found in your grace and your love, and who brings to life the gospel where we are. Whichever place it is, whatever time it is, he is here, he is with us, and in him, we are one together. And so we thank you for the truth of Jacob's ladder. We thank you for the great promise that all nations and peoples will be blessed by you. And we thank you that that is our deepest truth in Jesus, our risen Lord and Saviour. 
And so as we come to you, we pray that you will bind us together as one in him and in hope, in whose name we pray. Amen. So on the night in which he was betrayed, we recall how Jesus took bread and he broke it and he shared it with his disciples, with his friends. And in that brokenness of bread, there was that foreshadowing of what was to happen to him on the cross. And yet in that same bread, there was also the foreshadowing of his risen presence on Easter day, when all things are made new in him, our Lord and our Saviour. And so we hold in our hands the bread of promise promise for you and me, for our church, for all generations and for all people, the promise that we are not alone and that we are one in him. And in the reality of that promise, we find our identity and our hope. And on that same evening in that upper room, he took the cup of wine and he blessed it and he gave it to them and they drank it. He poured out his love for them. He spared nothing but gave all that he was for their sakes, just as he does for us. And he asks us to pour ourselves out into the world in love and hope and peace and justice and freedom that everyone would know his love through our discipleship and service, through our mission and our obedience to him, that as they meet us, they would meet his invitation, his grace, his welcome face to face. So we too take wine and we remember bread and wine, reminding us of whose we are and who is with us, scattered though we are, separate though we are today, we are one in him and we rejoice. So, Holy Spirit, we pray that you will come and you will bind us as one in him. Amen. So we take our bread and we eat and we remember Jesus, our Lord, is with us. And we take our wine and we recall his precious offering of his very self for us. That sacrifice of love in which there is life and hope. And claiming that for ourselves, we take and we drink. So let's pray. Loving Jesus, in the intimacy of this sharing, you are present with us. Your love stretching up to heaven and uniting us with your grace at our feet and with one another. Bound together as your body, we pray that we will serve you in the world in these difficult and challenging times that everyone who is struggling and yearning, everyone who feels lost, disconnected, dislocated, will discover for themselves that they stand on holy ground, for you are there with them at the very centre of their need. As you reach out to them, we pray that they would be aware of you, especially that through our care, you would be present to them, in whose name we pray. Amen. 
So may the story of Jacob bless you, give you hope and lead you forward on the pathway with Jesus. God bless everyone.